El Faro, the final moments. For the first time, we're learning what went on aboard ship in the hours before it sank in Hurricane Joaquin. The National Transportation Safety Board revealing the captain twice rejected suggestions he changed course. Disbelief and frustration from family members of the crew who lost their lives at sea. It shouldn't take six or seven calls in order to make that call. Had he done that sooner, way sooner, I, we wouldn't be here. The ship went to the bottom of the ocean on October 1st of last year. It was less than 90 minutes after it lost power near the Bahamas as Hurricane Joaquin approached. All 33 crew members died. Data and audio transcripts of the information recovered from the Voyage Data Recorder are now, sh are now shedding new light on this tragedy at sea. Our team of reporters is pouring through all that information, and we start with Channel 4's Chris Parento, who traveled to Washington for today's hearing. Families of several crew members also made the trip to hear the findings firsthand. Chris? Tom, there was a lot of frustration from these family members as they were leaving this hearing today. Frustration with Captain Michael Davidson after finding out that twice he didn't heed the warnings of other crew on the ship that they should take a more southerly direction to try to avoid the direct path of Hurricane Joaquin. I would have thrown the captain overboard and tried to save myself and the ship. Patricia Kwame voiced her frustration after learning the new information released by the National Transportation Safety Board on the sinking of El Faro. Investigators found that Captain Michael Davidson did not take the advice of others on board the ship. According to the new timeline, just after 11 p.m. on September 30th, 2015, the third mate called Captain Davidson's room to update him on the latest track of Hurricane Joaquin. Around 1 a.m., a more southern course was suggested. Still, the ship continued on the same path. The captain being the captain, um, I guess he decided that he was on the best course. And I'm pretty sure that when you're working for a captain, you're loyal to him. So they just decided to go whatever way he went. Family members say looking back, it's easy to see how things could have been done differently. It shouldn't take six or seven calls in order to make that call. Had he done that sooner, way sooner, I we wouldn't be here. Not going to put any blame on anyone at this moment. I think it's a whole comedy of errors. For family members who did make the trip to Washington, D.C., they now wait for the full investigation to be finished. They say some of their questions, though, have now been answered. Us as families, we, we're, we're seeing a whole picture of the maritime industry. Family members also got transcripts from the Voyage Data Recorder audio for the first time today. More than 500 pages of transcripts. We'll have that, a full breakdown of the frantic final moments on the Bridge of El Faro before the ship sank. We'll have that coming up all new tonight at 6 o'clock. For now, we're live in Washington, D.C. I'm Chris Parento, Channel 4, the local station. Chris, you were there in the conference room during today's announcement. What was the reaction from family members during that time when the new information was first being released? There were looks of disappointment, of anger, of disbelief, of shock on the, the faces of these family members hearing that crew members multiple times told Captain Davidson that they should take a different path, that they should try to go further south to avoid Hurricane Joaquin, and then hearing that the ship came as close as believed to be 22 nautical miles from the eye of the storm before that ship went down. Uh, a whole gamut of emotions for these family members up here in Washington, D.C. earlier this morning. So understandable. Chris Parento reporting to us live from Washington. Thank you, Chris. The El Faro disaster has touched the hearts of many people here in Jacksonville. Channel 4's Jim Pickett was with one family today as they learned the contents of the transcripts. He's joining us live from the El Faro Memorial at the Dames Point Bridge. And Jim, how are they handling these disclosures? It was a very tough time. You know, here at the memorial, it says, in our hearts forever. And I saw that today with this family and hearing some of the transcripts today and the reaction to that. Now, what was happening here today the, for the Jackson family, uh, they were there with their attorney as they finished up when they were there, actually when they were to going through those transcripts as well. But they talked to us today about some of his last moments. They believe he was with the captain at the time when the El Faro went down. Now, they're still planning to go ahead with their lawsuit against Tote Maritime. They say there's a reason for that because they just want to make sure that this does not happen again. We go forward as haunted individuals living 
because we don't know how we might have changed anything. We feel, I feel on some level, responsible that, that these people doing their job, doing nothing wrong, were, were lost to all of us. Now, their lawsuit, and they're one of eight families that are still planning on that suit, won't be heard until May of 2018. And their story is very familiar. Coming up all new at 6 o'clock, we'll hear some of that transcript as Chris was talking about and why they believe some of the last words coming from the Alfaro might have been from their brother. We're live at the Alfaro Memorial underneath the Danes Point Bridge. Jim Pickett, Channel 4, the local station. Thank you, Jim. The contents of the transcripts of the recorded conversations on El Faro are painful to read. Joy is taking a closer look at what was said by crew members before the ship went down. Joy? Tom, take a look. This is the transcript put together by the NTSB. This is a total of 510 pages long. The conversations included phone conversations with the captain about worsening conditions. And by one estimate, the ship would have been just 22 miles from the center of Hurricane Joaquin. Now, at 3 in the morning, the second mate can be heard saying, this ship can't handle this hurricane. Records show just over an hour later, Captain Davidson arrived on the bridge. He can be heard commenting that the weather was like, quote, a typical day in Alaska. Davidson would stay on the bridge as the conditions worsened. Then a distress call was made a few minutes after 7. It was received by the Coast Guard at 7.15. Just before 7.30, the crew was ordered to abandon ship. Captain Davidson could then be heard over the radio telling the crew to get off the ship, stay together. And moments later, the captain is then heard saying, bow is down, bow is down. And another member of the crew is heard saying, I'm gone. I'm a goner. Seconds later, the recording ends. Mary? Joy, thank you. Well, unless you're one of those familiar with nautical language, you may not understand some of the terminology used in the transcript, and Tarek is joining us now with some definitions. Tarek. Mary, in one of the earlier transmissions, the captain says he's not liking the way the list is looking. What the captain is referring to is the angle to which the boat is leaning or tilting while it is sitting upright in the water. A list indicates an uneven distribution of weight caused by uneven loading or the potential for flooding. Now, when the captain refers to the starboard side of the boat, that is the right side of the vessel, and the bow is the front or forward part of the El Faro. Now, when the, uh, the captain says scuttle, he's referring to the act of deliberately sinking the ship by allowing water into the hull. Uh, hull means uh, a, a hole breach means that a hole has been punctured inside of the ship. Tom. Thank you, Tark. As we heard from the safety board, the captain may have based his decision to stay on course based on weather information that was six hours older than the weather data the crew on the bridge was seeing. John has been looking into that part of this tragedy, and he's joining us now with more on that. John. Tom and Mary, imagine yourself being the captain here. You've been out on these ships. You heard him mention, ah, it's like Alaska. History may have played an evil role here, as again, this storm did not do what historically has happened with storms like this. Take a look at the track. The track tells the tale. Again, the storm was moving off towards the north and seemingly away from the United States and the Bahamas, but it turned that southwesterly track and intensified rapidly. You can see the ship just coming into view here as the storm went from a category one to a four within less than a day. The storm intensification probably caught the captain by totally off guard as well. And even as the storm bypassed, it literally went right over where the ship sank. So looking at some of the details, again, Joaquin failed to do what the captain had experienced. And in this case, again, early expect expectations were for the storm of Joaquin to be moving north and be weak, took a strange track, moved southwestward, and being a rare hurricane for that time of the year. I mean, it was October 1st, Tom and Mary. It's pretty late in the season, and it intensified very rapidly. So again, uh, the combination of events here were pretty tragic. 